you know, it's speaking of, of labor. Um, so I, I guess one thing, you know, that I, I also wanted to tie this into was that, you know, there's, there's been this kind of longstanding, uh, you know, pre Andrew Yang, right. You know, debate yeah, yeah. on, uh, on the left, uh, about whether the idea that we should have some kind of like universal support for having some kind of livelihood, uh, should take the form of something like a UBI, um, or it should take the form of something like a universal jobs guarantee, uh, which, um, is also, I know something you know that that I've, I've heard you talk about before, uh, and and you know we've only got a minute now, but I really hope you're going to come back to talk more about this with hey, me. I'll, I'll be back all the time to be with you. All right. Uh, so in um, you know, and this 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 other demand, this universal jobs guarantee, this jobs for all demand, right. uh, is something that uh, was uh, historically advocated by a lot of the uh, civil rights movement. Um, so in, um, in the, um, in the civil, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, in, uh, in that case, right? Like one thing I remember, for example, right? So, uh, when I was, um, and this is actually perfect, right? If you heard that digging, that was, that was Bhaskar telling me that, uh, that, that he's going to be like another 10 minutes, which, which I'm, which I'm glad about. Cause that, oh, that means nice. that, that means that we can, we can follow this thread, right? You know, so. Yeah, I uh, he was asking it and then it would have been all the better two generations of socialists, but that's beside. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and so in any case, um, like I remember, for example, right? So, so, you know, I grew up at a time period where, you know, maybe not in every state, but at least in Michigan where I grew up, you know, uh, you know, there, there, you know, we, we, we got a fair amount of like, you know, there'd be like a Martin Luther King day assembly where you'd, you'd hear yeah. like a certain amount of the, about the civil rights movement. And it was all good, but it was all also in retrospect, severely incomplete. Uh, so in, in a lot of ways, right. One of the most obvious of which, uh, is that it tended to uh, to skip uh, from um, from the um, from the march on Washington uh, to Martin Luther King's assassination, yeah. right? Which 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 happens four years later. So you never heard you know like a phrase that I never heard in any of these assemblies was "poor people's campaign," oh. uh, you know, for example. Uh, I also never heard the word Vietnam. Right, you know, mention, mentioned mentioned oh, wow. in these contexts, yeah. you know, because again, the version that they, they teach school kids, you know, like like does like like basically skips anything that would still be controversial. Yeah. Uh, and one thing I even remember, like some old social studies textbook when I was growing up, uh, that uh, you know was looking, you know, what they tell you about the March of Washington is basically the "I Have a Dream" speech, yeah. uh, and but there are accompanying pictures, there are photos of the march, and in those photos. Uh, one thing that you notice that that's really interesting, if you look closely, is uh, how many of the signs have UAW on them, right? United Auto yes, Workers. That's right. Uh, and another thing uh, that you might realize till later is that they very rarely give you the full name of the march, which is the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let, let, I mean, we could spend the whole next half hour, and I don't want to take up uh, Vasquez's time, but here's the thing. And I want to, I want to, I want to go back to the 1940s. We can mm, go to good. the 30s. Yeah, yeah, do it. But in 1944, FDR gave what really is sort of the culmination of his entire presidency in the sense that even as a candidate in 32, he was calling for an economic declaration of rights. In 1941, he issued his very famous uh, State of the Union message, which included a call for the four freedoms, which included freedom from want and freedom from fear. But in 1944, he calls for the creation of an economic bill of rights. And one of those rights, and I, just, I actually knew, knew this might come up, okay? It was the right to a useful and remunerative job and the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing, et cetera. In other words, the right to a job and the right to a job at a living wage, which he first argued for in 1933. Now, what's really important here is that he, repeated the fact that this was meant to be an economic bill of rights for all Americans. The, it, everyone knows the FDR administration did not make a big issue of civil rights. The FDR administration believed the idea was you would do a, a unit, whatever it would be, it would be universal. And that was his way literally of trying to create civil rights. 
for all of his failings. Now, A. Philip Randolph always heard these things and he always responded to FDR and they knew each other. And, and when, when the FDR administration began to prepare for the post-war years, they actually called for full employment, which was to say the right to a job. Now, in 1940, sorry, in 1963, it's A. Philip Randolph, the black and black civil rights and decidedly labor leader who was himself a socialist, who actually organized the, with- The uh, sleeping car porters you did, right? Right, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, right. And they, they're the organizers of the March on Washington. And people should try to read Randolph's own speech that day. And by the way, Martin Luther King was not involved in organizing it, though he gave the speech that has become the iconic speech of the day. Now, it's also worth noting, if we go back to 1943-44, that Martin Luther King Jr. was a very young, brilliant, precocious kid, and he entered university at like 14 or 15 years of age. And he was uh, uh, the, the, one of the major black colleges. I'm blank, all of a sudden, I'm blanking, down in Atlanta, not far Morehouse? from where you are. What's that? Morehouse? Morehouse, right? thank you very much, yep. Morehouse. And while he was there, A. Philip Randolph came to Morehouse and did a short residency and did a series of lectures. And this was also the time, of course, of FDR's Economic Bill of Rights speech. And, and King's father was very much a pro-Roosevelt, I can't call him a Democrat because that would imply a Southern Democrat, but he decided he, well, this was a New Deal family, okay? F, so Martin Luther King clearly is cultivating in his own mind an idea of social democracy or democratic socialism. So when we come to 1963, you've got A. Philip Randolph, Martin Luther King, and Walter Ruther, as you said, UAW leader, who is literally the guy who writes the checks to underwrite the March on Washington that brought 250,000 people to DC. And here's the next thing. In the following year after that speech, and soon, you get A Martin Luther King will soon after the Civil Rights Act is enacted and the voting rights, he's going to pursue the Poor People's Campaign. And he's also going to have issued um, um, a Minority People's Bill of Rights call. Similarly, A. Philip Randolph issues a freedom budget. And the freedom budget is a, literally a call to, make, to end poverty and make freedom from want true in America. And it includes over and over again, the imperative of full employment, basically, a guaranteed right to a job. If not in private industry, then decidedly the federal government will create those jobs, not make work jobs, but serious jobs, pay, paying a living wage. So this is all tied together. And, and by the way, I'll just leave it at this and we can argue about this sometime. I think it would be imperative right now for socialists, DSA and others, yeah. to do everything in their power to, to connect to the Black Lives Matter movement in the spirit of A. Philip Randolph and, and create this, this demand for social democracy. I think it's yeah. imperative. No, I, I, think that's, I think that's absolutely right. Um, so in fact, I mean, actually, the more I, I've thought about it lately, uh, the more that, that slogan, right? The March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom seems brilliant to me uh, because it connects together um, the particularities of the of the movement for full civil and uh, and legal equality for Black people, you know, that's that's the freedom part, uh, and doesn't you know without um, you know dismissing that or saying that's that's not important or that'll have to wait or anything like that, uh, but also instead of just having it be narrowly about that, right? You know, uh, there's it's tied into to an economic agenda that is certainly going to disproportionately uh, benefit uh, black people because black people have been disproportionately screwed over by the economic system in the United States. Um, you know, all the reasons I was talking about earlier with, uh, with, with Matt, you know, when uh, we were talking about uh, the bell curve, uh, but also, right. You know, it's, it's just, it's screwed over a lot of other people too, right. You know, that you, you can, you can build uh, a broad uh, cross racial uh, alliance to around a lot of these things. It's not just a matter of altruism, right? Like, oh, this this guy over here is suffering. You should be a good person. You should help him, right? Which, of course, that's great too, right? But like, it's particularly politically powerful when you can when you can say, hey, we've all been screwed over by this system, and here's an agenda that's going to correct that for all of us, right? You know, there's there's a 
there's a reason, you know, that, I mean, King knew what he was doing with the poor people's campaign, that that was that, that, that just referenced poor people in general, right? You know, that, that um, a vastly larger uh, portion of black people than white people, you know, were and are living in poverty because of the economic legacy of um, America's history of de jure racial apartheid. Uh, but uh, it's also true, right, that lots and lots and lots of other people are poor. Uh, and what you want to do, you know, if, if you're not just sort of more, you know, trying to make a moral statement, you're actually trying to try to change the world, right, is to, um, you know, is to try to make the biggest, broadest alliances that you can uh, around shared interests, say, you know, if, if we're, we're all being screwed over, right? You know, let's, let's, let's work together without, without neglecting those important points about, you know, civic and legal equality, whether that means ending segregation uh, or it means, you know, finishing the unfinished business of that 60s rights revolution when it comes to things like racial bias and law enforcement. Uh, but uh, instead of leaving it there, right? Because there's something a little bit odd about that view, right? That like we should, that we should be happy if the uh, percentage of people who are begging in the street for mutual racial group, right, was proportional to the population, right? That that would count as a victory or that, you know, the number of people uh, who are in, um, the, number of, the number of people who are, uh, uh, who are victimized by the police even, right? Because like when we talk about George Floyd, you know, whose murder started that, that wave of protests, you know, riots, you know, civil disturbance. Um, that I think it's important to remember that the specific context that this happened in was, uh, you know, Floyd, you know, was a black worker who had been laid off, you know, because of, uh, because of the of coronavirus. Uh, uh, and what he was uh, choked to death for uh, was trying to pass a bad $20 bill, right? So that this is a, uh, you know, this is a symptom of a lot of social pathologies, but, but certainly even though, you know, even though the poverty is itself um, unevenly distributed between different racial groups because of all this history we've been talking about, uh, it's also just a symptom of poverty per se. And it's a symptom of the way that uh, there has been this, this calculation uh, that, you know, that was made, uh, you know, in elite circles, you know, uh, especially, you know, spe you know, especially starting in, you know, the 80s and in the Reagan era and, you know, continuing after that, uh, that rather than expanding what little social democracy we've had in America uh, to try to reduce poverty, uh, it, instead it would be both politically and financially cheaper uh, to, to focus on uh, more aggressive policing, uh, a bigger carceral state to, to carcerally manage the symptoms of poverty. That, you know, that in other words, you know, there are all these social ills that go with you know, extreme poverty and economic inequality. Uh, and if you're not going to do anything about the underlying conditions, right, you know, then, then you, can, uh, you can at least like lock up a lot of the people, you know, who, uh, who have, um, you know, who are experiencing and trying to cope, you know, with the things that come, you know, come from that. Right. And there's a line I just wanted to, uh, to read you, you know, Bhaskar's going to be on in just a couple minutes, but um, there's a article, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it, uh, but if not, I'd really recommend it. It's by the uh, uh, historian I'm sure you're familiar with, Barbara Fields, uh, and it's in uh, Descent magazine. Uh, it's called The uh, Death of Hannah Pfizer. And, uh, and there's this, this paragraph in there that I just love, which is, therefore, those seeking genuine democracy must fight like hell to convince white Americans that what is good for black people is also good for them. Reining in murderous police, investing in schools rather than prisons, providing universal health care, including drug treatment and rehabilitation for addicts in the rural heartland, raising taxes on the rich and ending foolish wars are policies that would benefit a solid majority of the American people. Such an agenda could be the basis for a successful political coalition rooted in the real conditions of American life, which were disastrous before the pandemic and are now catastrophic. Uh, and that, that seems like a really powerful statement to me of the kind of politics that I think you're suggesting with these, um, you know, like talking about what we could learn from, from the civil rights movement and the way that it managed to, you know, um, to tie in 
these demands for full civic and legal equality for everybody, which are incredibly important, with the demand that instead of just um, distributing misery in a fairer way, we right. do something about the misery I, itself. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the way to, you can, se you can segue, okay? We'll wrap yeah. it up with this. Martin Luther King in the years just be, well in 67 in fact, made it a point of indicating in one of his books that the quote that he turned to when times were particularly tough was Thomas Paine's words, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, right? uh, so, uh, so thank you so much, so much, Harvey. Uh, we are going to have to do this again uh, very soon. Uh, they, I, I got a lot out of this conversation. Uh, this, uh, you know, this is good. We need to talk again. Okay, you bet. Thank you very much. Give my best to Bhaskar. All right, will do, Harvey.